Open the podcast bay door as hell. Welcome to episode 168 of Welcome to Geek Town. I'm your host, Kurt Onstead. As usual for the deep dive episodes, we'll do another quick intro. Anne and I were talking before we got into the show proper. You can hear that and other cut tangents in the Patreon-exclusive uncut version. And she mentioned her not wanting to be out in the bright light that day, which segued perfectly into our discussion of the opening of the show. Uh, well, if you're not feeling like bright lights, then you're not going to like the beginning of this episode. <laughs> you know, bright lights were part of my expected, but he did not. Loki did not wake up in a field. No, no, did not wake up in a field. Oh. Woke up exactly in the same place he was. Yeah, it did not change. But everyone else is gone. Yes. I mean, not only is everyone else gone, but there doesn't seem to be anything organic or human related in the entirety of the TVA. The pie room is empty. Yeah, I noted that as well when he went into the automat that there were no no pies. And when he gets to the control room, there's no coffee cups. There are tools. You know, there are books, there are pads, there are other bits of tech, but there aren't like coffee cups or plates or snacks or anything like that. There's just not really much of a sign of human habitation. Hmm. It was interesting. The loom there, I was expecting it to be in pieces. Yeah. But it but was still together. Yeah. Yeah. It was for first off, it was still together. Um, it was still running. It was pulling in all that messy temporal energy. It was spinning it. And then it comes apart. Those those yeah. branches come apart again a little way down the line. Um, Which is probably what is causing the destruction, is yeah. the fact that it's not staying this nice braided timeline. Yeah. Well, and in this case, I, here comes uh, the arts and crafts nerd in me. <laughs> it looks very much like, at this point, like a spindle. Uh, the one of the most ancient devices uh, in the world, which was for spinning wool into thread. So you hook your bit of uh, what what's called roving, uh, your bit of wool fluff, and then you spin the spindle, and you get a strand that is just twisted in on twisted itself. Twisted around, around, around. Yeah, which is very much like what you have. You know, that's the first two stages of the temporal loom, um, and then after that. Uh, once the your temporal spindle, spindle oh, just doesn't sound as good. <laughs> no, it doesn't. It really doesn't. Uh, but after you have uh, your roving spun into that twisting, you have to keep tension on it in order in to, order to keep it thread keep it from like. fluffing out. Yeah. Um, so I mean, it, it's now acting very much like that. You know, that almost prehistory device. You know, it's one of the first things we figured out with agriculture was how to take something's uh fleece and make it into fabric and mm. we didn't change that a whole lot for a very long time i mean conceptually we still do the same thing we just do it by machines and a lot faster right it, it, the super overthinking of this is that spinning was something that every girl knew how to do in your dark ages your middle ages your uh pre-christian europe Every girl spent time spinning wool. They had usually had it like in their pocket. So if you had a moment, you could spin. Because, I mean, literally Viking sails were made of wool that some little girl probably spun at some point, And then it was woven into sails. Yeah, um, and, and to I make just, that much wool into uh -huh. that's... It was constant. It was, you spent 
uh, like the spring and summer spinning, and then you spent the winter when you were snowed in, um, especially in the more northern climates, weaving uh, in order to produce fabric for whether you're talking sails or clothes or blankets. Mm-hmm. It was huge amounts of women's time were spent doing this. Uh, and just that feeling of something that is so old spoke to me of actual like Norse mythology, pre-Christian uh, Northern European mythology. I think I'm probably really stretching. You know, it might be interesting in a paper sometime. I don't think the writers really or designers really thought about this, but Probably not. But then again, we're talking about a show named Loki. Yeah. It's yeah. we're we're talking about Norse mythology in a way. Exactly. And so it might be something that somebody ran into while doing the Norse mythology research parts, mm-hmm. you know, and said, well, you know, here's a great design for how we pull temporal energy together and and it all fits together, and some crazy girl in uh, California is going to figure <laughs> all Altadena, this out. Altadena, California is going <laughs> to have all sorts of nerd pieces come together all at once. And uh... <laughs> it's all for you, Anne. <laughs> it's all for me. They made it just for me. And then I'll be sitting here going, maybe I should go to grad school so I can write papers about this. And for no reason, it sounds really pretentious. <laughs> or you can just go on a podcast and sound really pretentious there. I I can do both. (laughs) That's true. This is true. I mean, to go back to the MCU theme, a lot like last episode, they didn't do the proper theme. No, it was very, this haunting choral music. I I really liked it, it, but it really set the mood for this is going to be creepy. And it was very similar to last episode's opening choral music, but it was thinner. It, there was less of it. Mm-hmm. And apparently we are in fail-safe mode. Yes. Which those of us in who use computers are very familiar with safe mode. <laughs> <laughs> which is TV code 1229. Couldn't come up with any connection to that. Just random number. Well, even with uh, setting up the emptiness of the TVA, the... If you're making a movie, at some point, your sound guy is going to tell everybody to be quiet so he can get room tone. Mm -hmm. It's just a loop of sound that makes your sound design sound more organic. Just another layer of sound in the soundtrack. And the room tone that they use, that they recorded, was hollow. Um, And there's Muzak coming from somewhere. But we never get a source on that, which makes sense. It's Muzak. That's what it does. Yeah. And there's the recording going off, which is, you know, the uh, failsafe mode engaged. Failsafe mode initiated. Thank you for your service. Which is odd because apparently failsafe mode is evacuate everyone and put them back on the timeline where they went. Yeah. So who are you thanking? That's a really good (laughs) question. Well, and maybe it's a preparation you know they don't everybody gets the beat of thank you for your service and then back to their time fair enough i'm sure you noticed that each time slip means that loki's gonna flip his hair oh yes (laughs) we would you like a hair flip count now let's go ahead and do it how many hair flips nine times oh that's impressive. <laughs> so that puts us now at 16 total hair flips for the season. Very nice. It's funny because it seems like it's feast or famine with them. Yeah. We had like one episode with one, one episode with zero, and then nine and five. Well, it seems to accompany discombobulation, essentially. Well, it's yeah, every time he flips when he stumbles because now he's trying to clear his face of his hair. Yeah, and nearly every time he time slips, he has to do a hair flip. Not every time, but nearly every. So, back to the show here. Yeah, where were we? We were thanking people for their service. Yeah, creepily with a cheery Miss Minutes. 
graphic Loki it's like ha you know it's the miss <laughs> minutes from the uh opening film from the uh introductory film yeah well it, yeah it's a it's a pixelated miss minutes i right. i don't i assume that that is just a miss minutes icon and you know she's oh yeah still... no that's not the real miss minutes it's a an attitude yeah yeah but loki is time slipping again and yep. ends up in the command center where he sees himself <laughs> i like this little echo he sees himself then he time slips again runs down the hall into the command center picks up the tva handbook and there's himself time slipping in mm -hmm. from that previous moment it's a, a nice little loop yeah um it's a good setup to kind of let us know that we are going to be able to see two characters at the same time or not two characters. Sorry. It's a nice little hint that two we're going to be Two versions of. Yes. The same character at the same time. Yeah. It's setting up time shenanigans are about to take place. <laughs> <laughs> don't think about it too hard. You don't want to think about well well if you do think about it too hard the only answer is time is broken and now we need to figure out how it's broken how and to how to fix, fix it. it but then everything starts going wrong here as oh, yeah. the whole TVA starts spaghettiing out I love how they do this throughout the episode this slow dissolution and elongating at it's like you take the pixels and elongate them mm -hmm. uh, until it all blends together and vanishes. I like the theme in Marvel that when they do like massive destruction of either people or places, they do this slow, beautiful dissolution instead of you know sudden bah, kind of thing yeah uh, yeah i was going to similar... say it definitely reminded me of the snap yeah and the dusting effect mm -hmm. but it's more stretched out yeah. in these strands well, rather the than the process flakes. is yeah the process is spaghettification yes. um and i don't know if they ever associated any like specific process with the infinity gauntlet and thanos's snap but for that it was more like people were burnt uh you know there wasn't any like "Ooh, i'm on fire burning but it's like you had ash which then yes. collapsed yeah exactly but yeah both effects beautifully done mm -hmm. and just different enough that that they are very distinct from one another yes. yeah very distinct still process echoing the same sort of feeling mm -hmm. of inevitable disappearing and the fact that people can still talk while it's happening yeah is you know just creepy very disturbing yeah and that puts us right into the credits the the title screen i noticed the the ticking clock uh-huh added on and then the letters are disappearing yep so Things are going wrong and you're on a clock. Somebody noticed that Loki contained the right characters. So they could do essentially three, two, one, zero. Uh, right. L was three, K was two, and then I for one and O for zero. And really nice effect. Yeah. And then you get a very quick blink of back to the flat title card of Loki, um, mm -hmm. which occurred to me on my second watch through. There are some thoughts I have on here that are probably really kind of on the reaching and overthinking. This is probably one of them. Go for it. That That is what we are here for. <laughs> God. Um, and master thesis on Loki. Anyway, right after you get that quick blink of Loki, it occurred to me, it's like, oh, Loki is now he who remains because he's the only one. Well, I, I think there is so much more evidence in this episode for my theory from last episode yep. 
Loki is becoming the god of stories. Oh yeah, lots. I mean, there are some very clear lines that the Marvel comic book fans are probably going, yes, there's a lot of fist pumping happening. Oh yeah. Yeah. (laughs) But we now cut to somebody else's story. (laughs) Which is prison. At least partially a true story. Yeah. This is 1962, a branched timeline. All of the timelines we're visiting in this episode are branched. They specifically give us that information Mm -hmm. in the little graphics. And yes, we are at Alcatraz, where Frank, aka we know him as Casey, Casey, is escaping with two other men. And sure enough, on June 12th, 1962, Frank Morris yep. escaped with brothers John and Clarence Anglin from mm-hmm. Alcatraz. And they are the only escapees from Alcatraz whose fate is not known. Really? Yes. Okay, that actually explains some stuff that is in the end credits as well. I will note that by Eugene Cordello's name in the credits, he is credited as being Frank Morris. There you go. He is playing a real person. He looks yep. nothing like that real person. <laughs> Details! But, uh, well, but yeah. that's that's okay. I, I would rather have Eugene Cordero than a Frank Morris lookalike who yeah. does not have Eugene's unique comic timing. I have to say, I looked up information on this Alcatraz breakout, and they did a great job of recreating it. Interesting. Because they built dummy heads made of plaster, flesh tone paint, and real human hair to fool the night guards into thinking that they were safely in their beds. I was wondering where they got the hair. And then using crude tools including a homemade drill made from the motor of a broken vacuum cleaner. Nice. The plotters each loosened the air vents at the back of their cells by painstakingly drilling closely spaced holes around the cover so the entire section of the wall could be removed. And then behind the cells was a common unguarded utility corridor. They made their way down this corridor and climbed to the roof of their cell block inside the building. And the ceiling in the the room that they were using as a makeshift workshop was 30 feet high. But using a network of pipes, they climbed up and eventually pried open the ventilator at the top of the shaft. They were originally supposed to escape with four men, but one of them did not have his ventilator grill removed yet and so was left behind which Mm. is where the fbi has gotten a lot of the information on how this worked yeah because like i said they disappeared and they found bits of a makeshift raft and life preservers that were made out of raincoats that they had stolen or gathered and That's what they used to escape. And some paddle-like pieces of wood and bits of rubber inner tube were found in the water. And a homemade life vest was also discovered washed up on Cronkite Beach. But extensive searches did not turn up any of the other items in the area. So it's still unknown if they successfully crossed the bay. If they made it across, if they died in the attempt, no bodies were ever found, they disappeared. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's always one of the reasons they found Alcatraz to be so secure was crossing that water, even if you could get out of the prison. Yeah. It's choppy water, it's stormy, it's unpredictable, it's really cold, and it is shark infested. (laughs) So the the odds were against them. Very but, much, but sometimes you got to But according try. to this episode, they made it. <laughs> yeah. I find the process of them breaking out of prison kind of telling about Casey. Not just Frank, but Casey. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because we really get an echo of each of these characters. Yes. 
in their variants. Yeah. Casey, as we've seen him in the TVA, is kind of dopey. You know, he does his job, he goes about, but he seems, once we get him down into OB's dominion, we see that he has been vastly underused by the TVA. You know, Mm -hmm. he's got some mechanical and technical skills. He can read the manual. (laughs) Yeah, he's a, a good engineer. Yeah, he's a good engineer. And I feel like this is very telling about the TVA that they really do not care about the variants that they pull off the timeline. You are now here in the TVA. You don't remember who you were. Here's a job. You know, we care about the functionality and the bureaucracy of the TVA, but we're not necessarily going to use our people to the best of their ability unless Mm -hmm. they push the best of their ability, Um, which I think is what you have with Mobius. And Renslayer. Yes. You have to have a strong and vocal personality with some leadership to it in Mm -hmm. order to rise in the TVA. If you're a quiet person who could be really good at their job, you're not necessarily going to end up finding said job because you're not pushing yourself to find it. You have no hustle. I mean, isn't that the case for all jobs? <laughs> uh, that's a case for, I mean, a lot of stuff. I mean, that is a yeah. case against the the faceless, you know, office drone. Yeah. And before we, we finish this scene, because uh, <laughs> it's, it's pretty quick, but I love the callback to the first episode. If, if they catch they us, catch us they'll get us, like get us like a fish. Like a fish. <laughs> yep. Hey, Frank knows what a fish is. Yes. Casey doesn't, but Frank does. Well, and I found that interesting because maybe that might be evidence that the memory wipe happened while Casey was also working at the TVA, which is very likely. Mm -hmm. And that there are certain bits of information that keep getting either lost or inaccessible every time things get reset. You don't just lose your memory of your life before or your life the first round of the TVA, the first, the structure before of the TVA. Yeah. But you're losing bits of information that are common bits of information, but you don't yeah, need you, it. You get wiped and you start from scratch, basically. Yeah. You know, you know your job. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's about it. A new name and you know your job. Yep. At least one would assume. I mean, maybe people are choosing their own names. Could be. We have no idea how that works when the reset happened. We see here that Casey, or Frank in this case, doesn't recognize Loki. Yeah. All the questions that Frank asks, who are you? What are you doing here? Where's the boat? Which is relevant to his interest. Uh, Mm -hmm. But these are all establishing the conditions of the folks who were gone from the TVA. You know, this is exposition as much as anything else they're not gonna pull nearly as much who are you and why are you here later on because we're now established that there is no memory right it's a very succinct way of setting up here's what the new status quo is yeah if you run across somebody they're not going to know who you are everybody's been reset to their previous timeline Mm -hmm. and their previous existence And so Loki time slips as the three inmates leave on their makeshift raft. (laughs) Yep. And we have a short series of time slips here. Mm -hmm. We end up at Sylvie's McDonald's. Yep. Then to Piranha Power Sports with the inflatable wavy thing in front of it to Time Theater 25, which is where we started the series. Yeah. Yeah. And that one's interesting because we know the TVA has spaghettified away. Yes. So now we're at an earlier point. The fact that he's at the time theater means there is a TVA to get back to somehow. Mm -hmm. But when and where that is, is a mystery. Right. And after that, uh, he gets to stay there for a few seconds compared to the other two quick time blip, slips blip. that blips something else in the marvel oh universe. that's right it is <laughs> forgive me shoop, shoop. and then he ends up in 2012 new york city yes on another branched timeline 
And in this case, we start with our uh, subsidiary character. I don't know if that's the right word. Anyway, but this is about B-15. Mm-hmm. We are not with Loki yet. We are with her as she is bandaging up or finishing off the cast of a small child who has fallen out of a tree and broken her arm. Oh, poor thing. Well, I mean, we have this whole don't climb trees thing. And B-15 was a Minuteman whose job was to prune branches. Nice. I had not made that connection. I told you I was working out. My brain was working overtime on this stuff. Yeah, no, I like it. The only thing I got out of this was that her name is Dr. Willis. Yes, confirmed in the in credits. But what we learn, I think, about B-15's like core character here is the caring about lives. She's a mm-hmm. doctor. She's a pediatric She's a doctor. doctor. Yeah. And therefore, she, her entire thing is to make people better. And she's a children's doctor, which means she's working so children can have a future. Yeah. You you don't lose a kid because they got hurt. I love her performance here because she is so different from especially the B-15 that we met in the first season. Yeah. Her voice is completely different here. She's up in her higher register and... You can tell how caring she is. Mm -hmm. And once she saw that life and realized what was going on with the TVA, she's like, oh, no, we have to save Mm -hmm. lives. Mm -hmm. That's my job. Mm -hmm. And you're right. That that was her job in her original life. And so that now carries over into who she is in the TVA. I think with her time as a Minuteman, and I think maybe some doctor training uh, reflects this in a lot of ways, is that you're taught to follow a procedure in order to focus on thing, what needs to be fixed, what needs to be handled. Mm-hmm. Because every doctor does a, a round in emergency medicine, Yeah, you know, which is how you start learning triage. And I think B-15, as she was trained and became a Minuteman, that triage portion of her brain, essentially, we all have a triage portion of our brain. But that was what was trained and focused on instead. Of, I mean, nobody in the TVA, quote unquote, grows up at all, but they don't have much in the name of nurturing. Mm-hmm. I mean, the only sign of nurturing that we have had with any of our established TVA characters is one headbutt between General Dox <laughs> and X5 that we still don't have a good explanation for. No, and I don't think we're going to have time to get one. <laughs> no. And B-15 or or Dr. Willis has the most subdued reaction to Mm -hmm. Loki's appearance. She's dealt with emergencies. She's dealt with weird stuff in her regular life. And so having a guy suddenly appear and then disappear, she's just like, stops for a second, kind of breathes in. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder if she's thinking, okay. Am I hallucinating? Did I expose Uh myself to some sort of drug earlier? (laughs) Yeah. Well, or she's a doctor. She could just be overtired, which, you know, she's like, oh, God, I need some extra sleep because I'm seeing things. You know, it's a sign of, well, maybe I need a little rest. At the very least. I mean, normally a pediatrician like that, unless you're an ER pediatrician, is not going to be working so many hours that you're exhausted to the point of hallucinations. (laughs) (laughs) But because there was a guy and then he vanished and nothing else happened, she's now able to go, yeah, that was weird. Move on with life. Yeah. And from there, we finally, finally, (laughs) finally get Mobius on a jet ski. Finally. In Ohio. Cleveland, Ohio, 2022, branched timeline. We now know where he gets his love and knowledge of jet skis, but I also find it being in Ohio interesting because there are lakes, a lot of lakes, and there are some rivers around Ohio that one could definitely use a jet ski on. Mm -hmm. But it's not a place you associate a lot with water sports. True. It's not like... It's not Hawaii, Florida. California, Florida. Yeah, it is definitely 
a little outside the beaten path. Yeah. But like you said, Cleveland is right on Lake Erie. Yeah. So it's not completely out of the realm of possibilities. No, it is not. I just think Ohio is kind of funny for jet skis. Yeah. And I love the, how they bring it in because it's that very clearly a static picture as he's doing this oh, inner yeah. monologue it, on the jet ski. It was ski. like, okay, are these just really bad special effects or, okay, no, that is... is... Making a commercial? <laughs> what is this? And this is actually in his head. It's not in his head. He is on a jet ski. There yeah. is a background behind him of yeah. oh, blue yeah. sky. There is a fan blowing his <laughs> hair back. So, so everything true. we see is actually happening, mm -hmm. but he is not out on the ocean or the lake or anything like that. No. He is just trying to sell a jet ski to a guy who has absolutely no nope. interest in a jet ski he's just nope. there for the free donut tacky yes oh extraordinarily <laughs> tacky they do not waste salesman's time just for the freebies or please. donuts yeah you can spend a dollar get your own donut <laughs> your own donut and we get him uh dale his associate uh informing him that there's a call from one from his son which he says i'll call him back yeah Don, which is Mobius's name on this timeline. Okay, question. Did they ever say his name? Because I picked it up from the end credits. I picked it up from the subtitles. Okay. I I'm don't not think... positive they ever said his name. I'm absolutely positive they never said Dr. Willis. No, they definitely never said Dr. Willis. They do say Frank. Yep. And they, I don't think they say OB's nope. name either, but they you see not. it on the books. Yes. I think they're basically trying to not confuse the audience by yes. giving too many names for you to try to keep track of. Yeah. And so for the most part, they're just trying to stick with everyone's TVA name as best they can. Yeah. But they do at least put some sort of placeholder name in there that fits the yeah. circumstance. Exactly. And as far as we know, Frank is the only historical character. Yes. There is no real world equivalent to the A.D. Doug we get in the show or Dr. Willis or Don that we know of. Yeah. Frank is the only historical character, as you said. Now, Don here, personally, I think he's a bad dad. I agree. I absolutely agree. He's working six days a week. Yeah. Uh, nine to five every day. He ignores call from son one. Not too and long later, two. he's, uh, he's going to ignore a call from son number two. Uh, yeah. He mutters about, you know, being a single dad, which is just an explanation for Loki's benefit while Don is in total salesman mode because that's what he does. Mm -hmm. And we're going to see later exactly how Don does not have a whole lot of control over his life in general. No. It's apparent that Mobius is a happier man than Don is. Yeah, absolutely. Mobius can focus on his job without other distractions. Don is clearly suffering without somebody to help with the day-to-day. -day. Mm -hmm. I know we're talking a little bit later, but we have no idea what happened to Mom. No, she's long gone, gone. but that could be divorced, that could be dead. Yeah. Yeah, it's no idea. Using the term long gone does sound a little more like divorced and divorced badly. Divorced, yes. She took yeah. off. Yeah, I I would tend to agree with that. Probably she said you're spending too much time at work. Yep. Not enough time. I need at help home. with the kids. Yeah. We'll get back more into this shortly, but we have to go to 1994 <laughs> first. Oh, well, I will first know we have to get first we have to get Loki time slipping in and yes. doing his wacky waving inflatable arm flailing God, tube that band was impression. So good. <laughs> I don't know how that oh. chicken in the egg, on if they looked at it and said, do that, or somebody said, well, it kind of looks like that, and so, yeah. I mean, it had to be on purpose. There, There oh, yeah. is no way that that just happened accidentally, because he does spend a little more time 
waving yeah, his arms on, here. on this one and adjusting. Yeah. When they got to this specific shot, they said, okay, we want you to wave your arms like a, around like one of those inflatable things. I keep wondering when they got like establishing shots for the time slipping, if in order to get the film that they needed, in order to make the time slipping effective, they said to Tom Hiddleston, all right, wave your arms around like one of those inflatable thingies. And then somebody <laughs> went, huh, guess what Piranha Sports needs? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the that moment was just hilarious. I, every time I saw it, I was like, oh, Oh, that's just, uh -huh. that's adorable. <laughs> so, yeah, he time slips in, talks to Mobius again, or Dawn. Dawn doesn't recognize him, and off he time slips again. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, we're, it's a little frustrating that everything is in America. That is a fair cop. That, yeah, we are all in the States. Because here we are in 1994, yeah. and it's and it's all like within my lifetime, America. Yeah. The the earliest we have is like 1982 with Sylvie, if I remember. No, 1962 with Frank. Oh, okay. That you're is right. The you're right. You're right. Earliest okay, so thing that not, we have. Not in my this lifetime episode. for that one. Yeah, but it's still it, it's not that long ago. It's within our parents' lifetimes. Yes, um, yeah. and they wanted to use this very specific incident, for which I I cannot blame them. I think they used it very very well. Yeah, um, but, but and and of course Dawn has to be in a time period when jet skis are around. Exactly. But Doctor Willis and Doug could easily have been Doctor Willis, especially could have been anywhere in the world. I think they chose New York in 2012 very specifically because that's the avengers okay but there's no reference to that no. at all she doesn't no. react like nope. oh crap that's the guy from the battle of new york yeah there's no other the only reference to it we get is new york 2012 i mean that's it yeah i i it's... honest to god think that that willis's placement is sheerly for a nerd react I think not going any further back is for the sake of a uh, budget. Making the world look like 1994 is not as hard as making the world look like 1904. True. You know, it doesn't involve nearly as much set or costume design or anything like that. So it, it really could just be a budget constraint. Yeah, but you could have easily put her in Europe, in mm -hmm. Africa, in South America... It, mm -hmm. You know, you could have put her anywhere in the world, and same with OB, but instead we are in 1994, Pasadena, California. So, I live here. I mean, I live in Altadena. I'm just north of Pasadena. Um, I have friends who work at Caltech. <laughs> so, yes. it just, it made me go a little bit that, you know, here we have OB, who of course is a Caltech professor, mm -hmm. you know, made perfect sense. But being a Caltech professor is not really what, what he wants to be when he grows up. No, no. Nope. He wants to be a science fiction writer because yep. science fiction is a well-respected and thought-provoking genre. Which we know to be very true. But that's another point of this being 1994 because geek stuff was not cool in 94. The internet, it was... it, uh, okay. uh, not, not mainstream. It was not mainstream. Come on, we were no, there. but every bookstore had a sci-fi section, and this bookstore probably also has a sci-fi section. But it's probably one bookshelf. You know, it's like the airport sci-fi fantasy section. They're very that bookstore is very focused on bestsellers. You know, and it's not a big space. Incidentally, that bookstore does not exist in Pasadena. I'm kind of bummed about it because I like a good bookstore. <laughs> uh, and Romans has uh, Romans in Pasadena has a very good sci-fi fantasy collection. But yeah, they're they're focusing on bestsellers and stuff that really does generate money. Um, and this is also the point of the really big book chains that were just swallowing the little guys whole. Yeah, um, that's but true. this is 94. Sci-fi and fantasy are not mainstream cool. If you are into sci-fi fantasy. You are a nerd geek type person. 
and we're doing better. The internet has started to exist. Tech is starting to build, and therefore there really is a certain coolness that is starting to grow. But this is before the Lord of the Rings movies. This is before the Star Wars prequels. There are only the first original Star Wars movies. There's clearly no MCU. I can understand a small bookstore that is really trying to fight your Barnes and Nobles and your borders to be like, no, 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 we're not using shelf space for this fringy sci this fringy fat sci-fi. I mean, those are not small books. Yeah, I completely understand them rejecting his book. Yes. My only objection is to their response of, well, nobody buys it here to science fiction is a well-respected and thought-provoking genre. Oh, yeah. If they had said, yes, but you're not. Well, and it agreed, but I think we are also supposed to feel OBAD Doug's rejection and feeling very out of place. I don't okay. think that that's necessarily, hey, let's insult the genre. It's we want to establish this discomfort, which apparently worked very well on you. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, enough <laughs> of my complaints. And uh, your complaints are sci fi well, is, <laughs> yep, is a well respected they... and thought provoking genre. <laughs> and it absolutely is, but you have to be in that club. Yeah. So let's move along and return to Obi's home, where we <laughs> finally see the wall of post-it notes. Yep, from the end been credits. In the cred yeah, they've been in the end credits since the very beginning. Mm -hmm. So are these story ideas, or what do you... Uh, I paused at one point to, and I actually think by fate, not by purpose, to take kind of a look at it. It really does read like story ideas. Nothing mm -hmm. made any real sense to me. No, no. Um, there was, and there was nothing in there that I read that was like, okay. ooh, look at the Easter egg. Yeah, exactly. I was kind of wondering where we were on the Easter egg thing. Uh, but yeah, that I mean, that's a pretty common way, especially before you had really good uh, computer programs to handle it, to do book plotting out. Yeah. Um, I mean, heck, uh, I think television it's still easy still to do. Oh, yeah. yeah. They, I've seen many a post-it note or an index card mm -hmm. post, you know, thumbtacked to a, a board mm -hmm. uh, in order to move story beats around. Yeah. I will note on the set uh, design of OB's bunker, it's not yeah, quite I, a bunker. I called but it, it has an, a very an abandoned factory. Yeah. He mentions later on that they're miles from anywhere, which means it. I have no idea where this space is because that's a right. long way from Pasadena. We are a deep suburb here. Yeah, there there is nowhere near Pasadena you can get to that is miles away from anybody else. <laughs> yeah. Uh, unless you're halfway up a mountain, literally halfway up a mountain. Uh, but it all the uh, industrial stuff that is there very much speaks to, hey, we're close to JPL and we're making jet engines or rocket boosters or other things like that. And of course, there's this big funnel thing that very mm -hmm. much calls back to the loom, to the temporal loom that is over that. And I think all the fan spinning are supposed to be uh, an indication of the loom. Yeah, I, I and would it's a agree really with neat that. Space. I mean, it it very much felt like it. you could have put that room in the TVA and it yeah. would not be out of place. Well, the shape of the room is very similar to OB's department. Mm -hmm. It has that same kind of curvature and wide space. This, of course, is a much darker, dingier, messy, I don't know if it's any more messy or not, space. <laughs> no, I'd say it's right about the same level yeah, of, right, of right. clutter It's not as mess. well lit. <laughs> Um, and literally just thinking of it right now, that funnel thing may not just call the loom, but also might call to the uh, pneumatic tubes. Mm, yes. TVAOB has a D dug in a very similar place. You know, he's yes. attracted to the same. This is the environment he's comfortable in. Yes. Um, and if you also look at the environment itself, there's very clearly two sides of the room. There is a fiction side, and there's a science side. Nice. 
which, yes, that is the title of this episode is science slash fiction, yep. not science dash fiction. <laughs> yeah. Which is. And the fiction side is more cluttered than the science side. Which well, I think because shows, he has a lot of unsold copies of his books. <laughs> there's that, but I also think it shows that his heart is really in the writing and the fiction. And the science is just kind of what he does in order to inform his writing and because he can make a living at it. Teaching mm-hmm. at Caltech. I find the name they chose for uh, Timeline OB to be very interesting. Uh, A.D. A. Doug, Doug. Ph.D. Mm-hmm. A.D is, of course, something we attach to dates. It does not mean after death. It means Anno Domini. Don't get me started. Um, (laughs) um, So I think that choice is kind of part of it, that they were looking for something that kind of worked with OB, and somebody said AD, and then somebody else went, oh, like the year. And then probably said, oh, after death. And then another guy said, like, like assistant director. (laughs) And they're like, no, 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 no. Um, though having the after death uh, translation is also kind of interesting because essentially your TVA folks, quote unquote, died. You know, it's not quite that they died, died, but they disappeared. Mm-hmm. So after death, this is what we find. Anyway, it still stands for Anno Domini. Don't get me started. Which is Latin for year of our Lord. Correct. And Doug was an interesting choice as well. And I didn't parse out that it was Doug until the end credits. Because uh, either my eyes are not focused enough or the shot was not focused enough uh, on the book to really let me figure out exactly. So they westernized an Asian person's name. He chose a Western name for his writing, which okay. is something that's very common among writers pre-war, is that you would write under a pen name that sounded very male and white. Uh, in order to be taken seriously, there are so many female authors who wrote under male names. Oh, definitely. Uh, in order to get published. Although uh, you wouldn't then put your your picture in the yeah, back, in the back to, of the book. <laughs> to be like, this is what I look like. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, maybe somebody made that argument in the writer's room, but they also wanted to establish that the booksellers knew who this was. Because, right, yeah. dude, your picture's in the back of the book. The back of the book picture is also in the end credits with the photographs. This Right, yes. Yeah, this round. The molecule models that are hanging around the science side feel very much like the temporal mess that the loom is starting to sort out. Because there are so many little bits and pieces on it. And maybe that was just me interpreting things. I love how Loki time slips in freaking obi out and is like okay this is going to be hard to believe (laughs) and then cut to of course i believe you yeah oh this is a dream in my in my notes in my notes i wrote god bless the sci-fi fans yes (laughs) because we will when presented with an unusual situation we will take it in and accept it we're not going to be the ones going oh my god what's happening when the aliens show up we're going to be going bro (laughs) we're going to be like okay et or independence day (laughs) yeah exactly (laughs) but loki is not as excited when he finds out ob's current profession in this timeline is science fiction writer that that is my my favorite. I, I had to, to note the specific lines here. When you're a writer? Yes, yeah, science fiction. I'm doomed. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, it does imply he has... Loki is concerned that this OB has no practical knowledge that can help him. Turns right. out he's also a theoretical physicist and is more than open to any ideas that loki can share and at least looking at the problem i love when they 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 cut out the full discussion Mm -hmm. but they but uh loki says to ad uh loki says i need to get back before the temporal loom melted down and ob responds you can't it's impossible 
but don't let that stop you. That is a bumper sticker, guys. Yeah, I could put that on my car. I would like that. Yeah. And it makes sense when he gives the explanation. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, we know that he has time slipped within the TVA, which Mm -hmm. supposedly has no time, Mm -hmm. which is an impossible thing time travel wise. So he should be able to do this other impossible thing time travel wise Mm -hmm. because his time slipping is breaking it. It, It's breaking the rules. And so why not break the rules again? Yep. Of course, in order to do that, he needs to control his time slipping. Yeah. And this is the first time we get the idea that this time slipping is not random. Loki thinks Mm -hmm. it's completely random. It's not. I think as the audience, we realize that it's not particularly random, you know, fairly right away, at least in this episode, because first he's moving around the TVA, it seems random. But when we have that short montage earlier of him time slipping very quickly between places, there are things we recognize. We recognize that McDonald's mm-hmm. he's in front of Piranha power sports that clearly sells jet skis that yes. all of us are kind of going, wait a minute. And yeah, then we, he's we back know to who's where, here. Yeah. And then he's back to where he started his career with the tva yeah it's clearly not random to us because he's not winding up in the middle of a mongol horde or or on the the Cree home planet or (laughs) he keeps popping in to where his friends are and ad points that out to him this isn't random nope and ad asks is this a science problem or a fiction problem yep once and again, calling the, to the name of the episode. <laughs> yep. And we get the clarification of what the difference is. Science is what and how. Fiction is why. why. Which I thought was also bumper stickerable. Yes. Well, and I like how we find out at the end that it's neither. Yeah. Uh, but at this point, Loki says, okay. Sure, I need to control my time slipping. Let's try to time slip purposefully. Yeah. Uh, We have the first distillation of why Loki needs to control this. You know, why he doesn't just, you know, time slip off and tra-la-la onto the next thing. Loki Mm -hmm. states he needs to save the TVA to protect the universe from what's coming. And then that is what AD tells Loki to focus on in order to get control, focus on the why. Yes. And then we get the montage. Saving the TVA. Well, yeah, we get this quick montage. It reminded me of the first Spider-Man movie with Tobey Maguire, with the trying to do the webbing. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, he, he flails about and fails miserably. Many, many, many times. If you look closely, and of course I was, uh, Tom is getting wicked sweaty in this one. The shirt is showing sweat. Uh, Even from the first go, which means they probably used a take after he was squirming around a bunch. Or this is just a hot, I mean, he... he, It could be a very warm environment, yeah. This is Southern California. It could easily be 80 plus degrees and that is definitely not going to be an air-conditioned bunker. No, there's fans going, but all that's doing is moving the air. It's yeah. not actively cooling it down. After our attempt montage of squirming, we get OB going for straight-up experimentation, where he pulls yes. out the electric... <laughs> he pulls out the cattle prod to give him just an electric shock. And, man, that cattle prod and the time stick have a very similar design, don't they? Well... Makes sense. I mean, it's it's a poking thing. Yeah, it's, it's a similar concept. They, they're all going to look somewhat similar to one another. Yeah. yeah. And then tries to scare them into time slipping. <laughs> Which Loki's is like, adorable. Okay, let's, let's focus on other stuff right now. Yeah. And I have to say, just a, a, another little pat myself on the back here. 
Got to get the band back together. Yeah, no, Time we made both of us the team. made that call. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, the pen demonstration and the point is to get the collective temporal auras together in order to create coordinates for the time looms explosion. Yes. But in order to do that, you need a tempad. <laughs> And the handbook saves the day once again. And yeah, I, I do enjoy AD's reaction of, I am going to write a bestseller. <laughs> okay, sure. <laughs> Just let him have that one. He deserves yeah, it. Let, let him have his win. Hey, speaking of small victories. <laughs> Back to dawn as Loki time slips out again. And, man, single dad vibes here all mm -hmm, over the place. Mm -hmm. The yard's a mess. He's complaining about it. He's cutting to drastic measures. You know, all the toys that are out are going in the trash. Go save the house from being burned down. I'll get you a puppy. <laughs> yes. To which Sean, the elder son, says, I want a snake. Which... Well, he says, and a snake? Well, does he say uh, and like, a snake? Okay, yes. Yeah. yeah, he says and a snake. And Don is like, we'll negotiate later first. Yeah, because yeah, Kevin the Younger is uh, delightfully playing with matches. A little uh, bit of and, a pyro there. He is yeah, obviously and, the one who burnt the action figure. Which looks interestingly like a Minuteman. <laughs> Reasonable. Yeah. Sean, the elder son, is expected to act as surrogate parent. Yep. The sheet rope out the window is hilarious. I don't know if you noticed, but out of the second story window, there is a sheet rope. Uh, somebody tied their sheets together and so they could get out the window, which I thought was kind of a nice callback hint to uh, Frank escaping Alcatraz. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I missed that detail. Good oh, yeah. catch. No, I thought that was hilarious. And then Mobius kicks, or Don, kicks a ball into the little soccer goal and says, small victories. You know, he's got a really good attitude considering the difficulty it is, but it really might be the, I'm trying to hold everything together with a smile in both hands. <laughs> yeah. And this is when Loki shows up and mm -hmm. reintroduces himself. And Don's like, Hey, you know what? I'm still in salesman mode. Yes. <laughs> Let's go sell you my second jet ski. Yeah. There's a bit of an implication that Don is hurting for money. I would agree with that. Yeah. I mean, you know, I assume that he probably works on some sort of commission. He may yeah. have a small hourly sal salary, but his his main source of income is, is commission. commission. And so... Yeah, he's willing to sell off his personal jet ski. Or at least one of them, which probably was the wife's yes. jet ski. Or he doesn't care yeah. which one as long as they're down to one jet ski. Also, when he goes into salesman mode, as he uh, right before he opens the garage, he just drops the toys in his hand. Oh, which yeah. I, it... I love that it's just kind of like, well, that's where your boys get it from. <laughs> it's job. <laughs> <laughs> well, and... He's already established that when he is in salesman mode, he doesn't think nope. about his kids at all. Nope. So he's just like, never mind. Yeah. Time to sell. But Loki starts trying to explain why he's really there. And mm -hmm. Don is not a sci-fi fan. Because nope. <laughs> he, he reacts much more in the, okay sure mode yeah. and grabs the wrench as a weapon in case yep. he needs it yeah like, i don't want any trouble well and loki's approach to mobius at this loki's really pushing mobius's real identity within the tva you know, mm -hmm. that mobius is his real identity right. um you and are loki's really mobius and Loki, when he gets stressed, he's not good at being non-threatening. Because while his hands are still out, his tone is like, you will listen to me and do and follow what I'm saying. Stop goofing around. Well, you know. 
it's got to be very frustrating, it's, all right? <laughs> well, and it's got to be hard to completely abandon World Conqueror mode. Yes, because it has not been long since World Conquering mode. No. Yeah. No. I mean, obviously, Loki has gone through quite a change since that, but at the same time, he's still Loki. Right. But thankfully, before Dawn attacks with the wrench, <laughs> AD shows up in the time door. Yes. With the giant tempad. <laughs> I love that he's, you know, he's using 1994 technology. So, exactly. of course, it's not going to be able to fit in a little well, tablet. There are like, a few cell phones out you know they're mm -hmm. not they, they are not common only people and who they like are really... not they are not smartphones in no. any way shape in or form any way shape or form we are so far from smartphones yeah um i mean even laptops were not terribly common at the time they existed yeah. and people had them again if you needed to move around you know if it was really important for you to be mobile with your computer but they were way more limited Although the AD that walks through this door is actually from 1995 or maybe even 1996, because been it has been 19 months. months. 19. 19. He, he, yep. he lost his job and wife. Yeah. Now, I had assumed that that was his living space. There and is not evidence of living, though. Uh, okay. there, I mean, like, there wasn't a bed, there wasn't anything to cook with, that sort of thing. It, it is probably that he spent most of his time there. Could he afford to rent a giant building for a second? I mean, he wants to be a writer. Right. His Caltech work, his teaching, and his PhD is secondary to him. So... It's hard for me to imagine him renting a giant abandoned factory for not living there for you right. know for just just an extra space to go to. It, that's kind of fair, um, but he also could own it outright. And if we're talking about someplace that is miles and miles from everywhere, I mean, we've already talked that this the setting doesn't make sense in compared to Pasadena. Right. That is nitpicky because we know the territory, mm -hmm. um, but it could have been property that he bought. And if it's out in the, literally out in the middle of nowhere, you can buy cheap property out in the middle of the desert, especially Fair in 94. Yeah. Um, it wasn't, it wasn't out in the middle of the desert. We do get no, an establishing shot, but yeah, it was, it in was the middle of the, they're, they're not woods yeah. like that around here particularly. <laughs> um, there's some branched timeline. Time <laughs> sure. The mountains don't burn on a regular basis. Sure. I like that. Can I live on that timeline? <laughs> yeah, seriously. Yeah. I, I mean, that could have been part of it is that, you know, you spend all your time at work. I'm out of here. Of course, it, work being working on the temp pad because yeah. he also lost his job. Yeah. So, yeah. I wouldn't have assumed AD was married from the interactions we had gotten with him so Earlier. it was surprising to say when he said that he had lost his wife well and i think that he was not happily married again he is of asian descent there could have been a lot of family pressure to marry and i mean it was might have been next to or an arranged marriage and I, with the he's brilliant he needs somebody to take care of him kind of thing <laughs> so you know, and they, at this point, he's lost both the income and the prestige. Yeah. So she's out if that's a, an arranged marriage, essentially, or a not particularly loving kind of marriage. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you marry somebody for the sake of being married, not for the sake of wanting to be with that particular person. Right. For the social status that it provides you and exactly. all that sort of thing. So what we now have is this collection of men who are at crossroads. Not only are they in this very strange situation, this time traveling situation, but we get to see where they are in those timeline lives, those ordinary lives. 
Um, Mm -hmm. Mobius' life is a mess. When he is presented with the idea of going through that time door to get the band back together, he's very torn. Because what he is looking at is the mess that is his life, but he's also looking at the paths not taken, the chance for adventure, the chance to live to a certain potential that he's misplaced. This is, it's very midlife crisis kind of thing. Yeah. It doesn't take a whole lot of convincing. There is like, the only thing Mobius that is, is a pretty holding, cool name. <laughs> yeah. The only thing that is holding him back is that he has two sons. That is literally the only thing that is tying him to that branched timeline. And once he is assured that he can be brought back to the exact moment by having the shot of Loki approaching Mobius as he's hauling in the trash cans, then Mobius is in. OB is very similarly kind of at that same place where he's tried both the practical career and the fantasy career um, you know, because being a successful writer can tend to be a daydream kind of career. Some people hit oh, it, some people, a lot of people don't. Yeah. But he went with this exciting project with possibility, but that means he lost so much of what made what makes up a quote unquote real life. You know, yeah. marriage, he family, went with, job. He career. went with fiction instead of science. Exactly. Absolutely. Exactly. Anyway, Loki is now convinced. OB very easily. OB's yes. gotten to work on the process. He's convinced Mobius, so we got Although two members the, of the band uh, back. The temp pad is a little oh, man. <laughs> It is so janky. And it's so much fun to watch him while it's being janky, because he's like, bup, 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 Door bup, floats bup. up, moves over. over. It's, it's like he's playing Tetris with it. I, I'm surprised we didn't get one shot of somebody walking out the door and tripping as they <laughs> fell, as they were two feet higher than they expected to be when they stepped out or something like that. Yeah. But yeah, as you were alluding to, they, they've they gotten part of the team back together and we get an incredibly short team assembly montage yep. as B-15 and KC are brought in or dr willis and frank yeah i i do wonder how loki talked b15 into joining them because i can imagine that one be a kind of a hard pitch a lot like mobius but he probably focused on the saving all of humanity aspect of it exactly and the fact that he walked in through this yeah impossible door lends a lot of credence to his this is going to be hard to believe but but <laughs> but and with, see this door made out of amber and, energy and with frank giving him an opportunity to be free and possibly ditching his criminal past it probably was not a hard sell to frank yeah hey i can i can get you away from where the cops are looking for you uh-huh. <laughs> how would you like to be anywhere else <laughs> yes uh because we do get this lovely slow shot of everyone in the bunker mobius is having coffee b15 slipping through the books mm-hmm. casey swipes a part off of the science side and puts it in his pocket it's probably for a weapon you know he doesn't there's no reason that frank is going to trust these guys no you know and all of his dialogue is focused on robbing banks and <laughs> And getting away. And well, I mean, the first he's like to point out part- Frank Morris. Frank Morris was a bank robber. Nice. So that is right in line with his real life persona. Yeah. Well, I mean, in his list of dialogue is like, wait, that means you could take me to a park, or the Grand Canyon, Canyon? or inside or a, a bank, bank vault. vault. <laughs> yes. It's a nice. He leads up like, to it. Freedom. Pretty freedom. Wait, bank money. (laughs) My feeling on it was that it was more of a, I don't want to go straight to bank vault with this guy. Yeah. I want to lead into it and gently approach the subject before we. I I don't know. I I feel like it was more, we're looking at his kind of subconscious response that he wants to be out in the air and green space, very different from prison. Yes. Uh, And then he goes, 
big, you know, maybe a chance to see something big and meaningful that I've heard about my whole life. You know, Grand Canyon's a pretty common, big, pretty thing. Yeah, it's it's a bucket list kind of thing. Exactly. And then he reboots back to, oh, wait, <laughs> wait, 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 this is all going to be possible if I have a bucket of money. Let's hit a bank vault. You know, he goes back to career after that. Yeah. But I, I feel like there's levels of conscious thought happening here. Outdoors and pretty, specific outdoors and pretty, back to work. Yeah. Yeah. That wasn't how I read it when I first watched it, but I can totally understand that interpretation. And Mobius is still trying to get a grasp of what is happening, so he needs to kind of talk through things, which is, this is how we get some exposition. Mm -hmm. And now we need to go get Sylvie. One member of the band is still missing. One more. And sure enough, we cut to Broxton, Oklahoma again, and Mm -hmm. Sylvie, who's coming out of McDonald's with a bag of food, places it on the truck, and it disappears. It spaghetti's out just as she's unlocking the door, and she doesn't notice it. Mm -hmm. She sees that it's gone, but she Mm -hmm. did not see it disappear. It vanished, yeah. It, that's for setting us up, yes. you know, to let us know exactly how endangered this timeline is. Mm-hmm. It was nice and subtle. It was one of those things yeah. where if you're just looking at her, you may miss it. Mm-hmm. They don't focus on it, but it's definitely there. And now Loki's there. Mm-hmm. And she she remembers who he is. Yep. She remembers everything. My theory on that is when she was on this timeline previously, she was aware of Loki and the TVA. Yeah. She remembered everything when she moved to this timeline and made that her timeline. Yeah. And so when she was reset back to it, she was reset back with all of the memories that she had when she left it. Yeah. Uh, also could be a side effect of godhood or being just being as guardian. Right. Um, that it's, not as easy for her memory to be erased. That is also a possibility. But they have a little bit of back and forth, and then she said, after Loki has a bit of a time slip. Yes, he. I called it a half time slip. Yeah. He's not quite in control yet, but he's able to keep himself there for this yeah. one. And yeah, she's she goes, she's getting the car and buying you a drink. Yep. Exactly <laughs> the right our, answer. Our, our first appearance of Brad in this episode. Brad! Sorry. <laughs> Every time for no reason. Yeah, in Zaniac the video game. <laughs> yes. I thought that was a, a nice little callback to, to Brad's mm-hmm. experience on the timeline. Well, it also implies that, you know, Brad's back on the timeline because... You know, Zaniac, well, is eno- Zaniac is enough of a thing that they made a video game of it. Right. But, you know, we don't know which timeline this is compared yeah. to the... There are so many timelines out time there. Lines. Yeah. This is probably not the same Brad who we saw. It was just... Mm. That was Brad's original place on the timeline was yeah. as an actor. And so in other timelines, there are other Brads who also played Zaniac. Yeah. Anyways, Loki explains what's been going on, and so he's like, great, everyone's back in their real lives. Yeah. That's a win. <laughs> yeah. The problem is those branches are fading. But she doesn't know that yet. No, she doesn't I mean, know She knows, yet. you know, I assume Loki explained that the TVA spaghettied out, but she's yeah. like, fine. Yeah. The less the TVA, the better. Mm-hmm. And Loki calls her selfish. Yep. And Sylvie Sylvie says, yeah, I just want to live my life. It's reasonable to be somewhat selfish. It is. If you sacrifice everything for the greater good, you will be dead before you can do anything good. Yeah. You have to be a little bit selfish. You have to take care of yourself Mm -hmm. a certain amount. And she's able to point out that Loki is selfish as well. Mm -hmm. While he does have the altruistic motivation as well, but he also just wants his friends back. 
yeah, he admits that what he really wants from this journey are the friends he made along the way. And he doesn't know where he belongs without his friends. Yeah. I find it interesting that he's had to leave humanity. He's had to have humanity ripped away from him, like all the existence of everybody else, for him Mm -hmm. to find his own and his own connection to it. Well, he's had his Ars (laughs) Gadanity ripped away. He's He is much more human than he ever was. He has to deal with people as people now. He's not a prince. He's not a god anymore. He did not manage to conquer the world. He no longer sees people as ants and servants and cogs in the machine. They are now people. They are now friends. And they need to be saved. In order to save them, you save the universe. And here's one of the big lines that pointed back to the god of stories Mm -hmm. as sylvie says we're all writing our own stories now go write yours and he kind of blinks at that he's like oh yeah Hmm. Yeah." it's a very sad yeah kind of acceptance yeah because when he comes back he's given up yeah the reunion tour is cancelled let's send everybody home though in case he wants to be at a park or bank vault yes <laughs> yeah turns out sorry i i just wanted this for myself i yep. i it wasn't to save the world sorry i gave you that excuse i just wanted to see my friends yep from there we cut to sylvie and the record shop where we find the monkey that's been in the end credits. Yes. And man, this whole scene, I absolutely I love. So amazing. Oh my God. Beautiful direction. Beautiful direction. This actor here, mm-hmm. who's the record shop guy, he has Wild. just a tiny little part, but he does a great job with it. No, you want more of this guy. You want to, yeah. you don't only want more of this guy, you want this guy and his shop in your neighborhood. Oh, because absolutely. All of this is cool. Every inch of this is cool and deep. And it hits that place where that quiet moment where you feel very seen, even though nobody is there. And Lyle is another guy who has established that he pretty much lives at work. Mm -hmm. You know, this is another person whose identity is his his job, his shop. But he's really good at his job because he's that kind of record shop guy who's like, oh, you're in this mood. You need here this. This. And his exact line is this will either kill what ails you or make it a whole lot worse. I thought he said kill instead of cure. I just inter- cure makes more sense. Yeah, I had the subtitles on. It was cure. That's true. It's cure. Good. <laughs> the record he hands her is the Velvet Underground's Loaded. Mm-hmm. I will note that that kind of mirrors his line in a very beautiful way because the Velvet Underground, or at least Lou Reed, was very infamous for his use of heroin, which is a drug that you will completely forget about what's bothering you or it's going to kill you. Yeah. It, it's something that can just erase everything, but you will either could die from it or you are now addicted. Yeah, I think heroin is still noted as the most addictive drug out there or you know, maybe oh, something that's... surpassed it since. Yeah. I, um, I think I think something like fentanyl is is yeah. maybe up there, but uh but yeah, definitely and the album title loaded mm-hmm. is a double reference because they were asked by their record label to produce an album that was loaded with hits <laughs> and then they also used it to refer to being really high on drugs yep and then the song that sylvie listens to is oh sweet nothing yes very fitting for what's about to happen. Yeah. Although the nitpicker in me will point out that Oh Sweet Nothing is the final track on ah, side two, not the first track on side two, which is what she plays. <laughs> but branched timeline. Branched uh, timeline. <laughs> they put that one first. On this timeline, they said, let's put Oh Sweet Nothing first. Yeah. 
Uh, there is also a record player in the end credits, but it does not have this record on it. Mm -hmm. And then we get some beautiful camera work that starts from above Sylvie and then like directly above Syl Sylvie. And then, yeah, as she leans back and just takes in the music, yeah. which I have had those moments. Uh -huh. The first time you listen to that album that just uh -huh. gets you. Uh huh. Oh, so good. Uh -huh. Yeah, so it goes from above the sprawl out, it circles down in front, and then it pushes in. And then we have the guy who enters the shop from behind her, mm -hmm. and then immediately spaghettifies slowly. But the door closes, and the bell rings, and there's nobody there. And Lyle looks up, and then his coffee mug coffee with cup, the, his coffee cup is gone oh with the space with a flying saucer that said take me with you mm -hmm. yeah and the universe is now dying yes at least this universe yep and he he runs to try to get to her but it all it, it's not fast enough but so sylvie does notice from there yes yeah when he screams out her name that gets her attention and yeah. she removes the headphones and sees what's happening and i love how it all starts to center around the record, record. and the world is spinning with yep. the stationary record in the middle as she watches it just strand away yeah and thankfully she still has he who remains his control mm -hmm. his stone tempad whatever that thing is and the final shot of that dark spaghettified universe yes just the absolute nothingness uh it's so gorgeous that whole sequence is mm -hmm. perfect so from there we cut back to loki telling him sorry i was wrong you know yep. continuing the scene from previously and says the the tva you're all fine without it and sylvie makes the perfectly timed entrance to be able to say <laughs> yeah no, no. they aren't <laughs> the branches are dying yep but now we have the band back together we do all we need to do is read their collective aura on the oh no uh oh <laughs> tempad's gone Mm -hmm. It wasn't Frank who stole it. Nope. It was the universe stealing it. Yes. It had spaghettified away, and at this point, so does Frank. Mm hmm So does A.D., who gets his final line of, it was a fiction problem. Then Mobius, B-15. What surprised me was Sylvie. Mm-hmm spaghettiing out i thought it was going to be the two of them again mm -hmm. left alone yeah but no it's loki all by himself he's so desperate he tries to grab mm -hmm. the spaghetti strands well and i think sylvie did it too and they just poof yeah you know, they they just poof away and as sylvie fades we start getting some bits of dialogue mm -hmm. that are old bits of dialogue along with sylvie's uh, from season one do you think what makes a loki a loki is that we're destined to lose yeah the lines of dialogue are from earlier in the episode to mm -hmm. la all the way last season like you said mm -hmm. so it's it's all over the place but it's it's all people's kind of desperate and mm -hmm. Dawn saying, I need to get back to my kids. Mm -hmm. You know, you hear Obi saying it's a fiction problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all of those those lines. And Loki just screams. A good old-fashioned Wilhelm scream. Yeah. Which has him time slip back, you know, 10 seconds. Yeah, just a little bit. But then he does it again, this time on purpose. Mm-hmm. Time slipping right back to Sylvie's entrance. And here's where he tells us that it's not about where, when, or why. It's about who. And he once again 
starts to take his his godhood on again as mm-hmm. he says, I can rewrite the story. Yep. And we are back at the uh, blast doors, looking down the hatch. Not exactly sure exactly when they're looking down the hatch, but it's probably before Victor goes out. My feeling is, well, yes, it was before Victor went out, but I think Victor had just walked down the stairs. Okay, I To get suited up. Yeah. That's my feeling as to where it was. So... Is Loki going to take his place there? Good question. Is it because Loki is time-slipping that he is immune to the radiation? I assume there has to be more to it than that, because otherwise that's a very short episode. Yeah. If it's just Loki walks out and does the throughput multiplier instead of Victor, that's five minutes that you can do that. Yeah. We might end up with a Groundhog Day situation next episode. Yeah, there could be some sort of time loop where he has to get it right. Yeah. Yeah, that would make sense. That would be a a good way to end a time travel story. Mm -hmm. But how does he break it? That's a very good question. I could see him running out the first time and him spaghettifying out Mm -hmm. and then coming back and being right back where he was and Mm -hmm. then being like... Okay, gotta do this differently. Yeah, what's the actual solution? The only thing I can see is him reascending to godhood Mm -hmm. and rewriting the story. That would be a good ending. That would be a season finale. That would be a season finale that would reestablish Loki into the main MCU as a new god. Mm -hmm. But not a new god from the DC character stable Uh, that's a different thing it's entirely different yes so that's my theory where we're headed okay or where we're where we'll end with loki basically able to somewhat rewrite reality Mm -hmm. by rewriting the story by becoming the god of stories that seems to be where we're headed but but we'll have to find out next week because yeah we get to the end credits and I love, I love how they altered the end credits and the opening title screen. They just make it a little bit different each time. And this time, the names are kind of, you see the letters in the names kind of tilting or slipping away. And the lines are now making different branches. Ooh. It's really well done, the end credits here. And I felt that the music was more intense. Yes. This round. But that could be me being crazy, but it felt more intense. No, no, no. You were, yeah, it it was definitely, yeah, I don't know what it was exactly, but it it was definitely darker and more intense Mm -hmm. than than the regular end credits. And did you watch all the way to the end? Oh, I did. (laughs) <laughs> um, let's, I want to mention the photos first, because again, okay. there's always that shot where they have a different set of photos. Mm-hmm. Um, they have Mobius jet skiing in the showroom. Yes. You know, he has that very intense, I'm totally jet skiing, but it's the static background and he's wearing a fleece vest. Which do not jet ski in a fleece vest. <laughs> no, that strikes me as a terrible idea. It has a picture of the other two jailbirds, uh, the brothers. Uh, Mm -hmm. And that photo, I'm honestly not sure if they're dead or alive, because one of them is just kind of like, you know, kind of staring ahead. The other one has his eyes closed, Hmm. which I thought was interesting. Most likely it's because they got pulled off the timeline at some point, uh, which is why they were never found. Sorry, no one's ever supposed to escape Alcatraz. (laughs) Yes, exactly. (laughs) Too bad. We have a photocopy of B-15's ID as a doctor, and we have Obi's dust jacket. Yes, his dust jacket photo. A very professor pose with all the things. And then there's a shot of a photo of Loki holding the TVA manual, but the background is completely undefined. I mean, he's somewhere, but it... I could not tell anything about where he was. It's probably just a still from the scene early in the... Yeah. The show where he yeah. was in the control center. Probably. And then at the very end of the black and white credits, all the way, but uh, before <laughs> you get to the uh, foreign voice actors. Right. 
Brad's arcade voice gets the final line at the very yep. end of you died insert your coin loser it's a really nice touch <laughs> yeah it, it's it's just a, a fun little yeah I, I'm guessing that they brought him in to do a few scripted lines for that mm -hmm. and while they chose the one that they used in the bar which wasn't that line it, no, I can't remember no, it what it was yeah, it uh, was like Zaniac needs yeah. coins or, you know. Something like it that. It was still something along those lines of yeah. insert a coin to play. Exactly. But I think that the the director went, oh, that read is just too good. We got to put it somewhere. So at the very end of the credits, they put the, you died, insert your coin, loser. Well, and, you know, that's a very game over sound. Oh, yeah. Yes, and it is. so it fits the very end of the episode yeah. even better than the other line that they used in the show did. Yeah. And since we've reached the very end of the episode, there wasn't much more to say after that. Thank you again to Anne for joining me to discuss the show. We just have the season finale next week, then I'll be back to regular scripted episodes. As always, I'd appreciate hearing from you with any questions you'd like answered down the line. Please send those via email to welcome to geektown all spelled out, at gmail.com. Or you can go to the website, welcome to, the number two in this case, geektown.com, and click the submit a question link if you'd prefer to remain anonymous. Other contact options include facebook.com slash welcome to geektown, twitter at geektown podcast, Mastodon at welcome to geektown at mastodon.social or blue sky at welcome to geektown.bluesky.social. Also, if you'd like to support the show directly, why not become a patron at patreon.com slash welcome to geektown for just a dollar per month to get access to full scripts of the shows, audio outtakes, and a monthly shout out. You can also help the show grow by subscribing and giving a five star review over on Apple Podcasts to join the Geektown City Council which helps other people find the show, so we can all tell them... Welcome to Geek Town. Population. Us. Welcome to Geek Town is written, narrated, edited, and produced by me, Kurt Onstead. Theme music is by Aaron Lovitz, logo art by Archie Santana. All other sound clips of the copyrighted material of their respective owners, and no infringement is intended, falling under fair use. <laughs> <laughs>